Okay, welcome to the 45th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Robert Vercake. Uh, Robert is an author, journalist special, specializing in security and social mobility. His journalism appears in The Guardian, Independent, I Newspaper, Sunday Telegraph, and Sunday Times. In 2013, he was runner-up at the National Press Awards for the category of Specialist Journalist. Robert has also been long listed for the Orwell Prize and the Paul Foote Award. In 2001, he was named Lord Journalist of the Year and has twice been runner up. He is the author of five books, of one of which is this one here. So lovely to, to have you uh, on the podcast. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Piers, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to chatting through some of these issues. Yeah, yeah. So I came across your book a few years ago. Um, I think I was reading uh, Richard Beard's book at the same time. And a, a friend of mine was like, oh, I think Robert would be a great person to speak to. Um, so I reached out. Um, so, yeah, I'm just really excited to kind of explore these issues a little bit further, uh, something I'm very passionate about. Um, so I'd love you to share a little bit about some of your journey into the work you now do. Yes, yeah, so I've been a, a journalist for more than 30 years. I'm, I'm really a failed barrister, actually, because I, I started off trying to be a, a lawyer and did my, did my bar exams after university, but um, miserably failed to get a few so never became a, a barrister so fell back on scribbling and um i used 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 the law actually quite a bit in my in my journalism i became legal editor of the, the independent newspaper and um law is a good sort of launching pad into all sorts of areas because you know people on the newspapers take you more seriously if you've got a, a legal background so that, you know i found myself being asked to do you know, work that perhaps I wouldn't have been asked to do had they known just how little I really knew about these subjects. So law was good in, in journalism. And then, um, as I say, I branched out and did more sort of security work. So the war on terror was what I kind of specialised in. So from 9-11 um, through to Guantanamo, which I visited, mm -hmm. and then the, the terror attacks in this country. Um, and the role of the security services in dealing with the terror threat. Um, and I carried that on through to the Mail on Sunday where I was security editor there for a couple of years. And then after leaving um, the Mail on Sunday in 2014, I think it was, um, I started writing about things that, you know, I was more, more I felt more constrained around so I, I, I'm much freer to write about what I really was interested in um, so I was going to get away from terrorism I was going to write about social mobility and mm -hmm. the sort of things that I write about now but uh, my past caught up with me and it emerged 2015 that I interviewed someone called Mohammed Mwazi who turned out to be Jihadi John and uh, at the time he was still carrying out his murderous executions in Syria. So the story was, you know, I was at the right in the center of the, of the story because I'd, I was the only journalist who'd ever spoken to him. Mm -hmm. um, so I, would, I, I became um, much more focused on, on terrorism and the, role of, and the role of ISIS and the British um, jihadists who traveled to, to Syria. But anyway, oof. You know, finally, um, uh, you know, we, we, we hadn't won the war on terror, but the interest had sort of petered out. And so I was able to ex sort of continue that uh, desire, interest to pursue sort of topics that I'm writing about now. And I wrote in 2017, 18. I hope that wasn't too detailed a, uh, a journey yeah. for you. 
no no sometimes people talk for 20 minutes about <laughs> exploring that so no i find it useful i was listening to your interview with tim lovejoy where you went into a little bit uh, more depth of that so i kind of knew a little bit of the background um and your more recent book is uh i think it's why you won't get rich that's right yeah uh, how capitalism broke its contract with hard work which i think uh, rather pertinent given what's happening to the country now and the cost of living crisis so i mean it's an examination of this was written before um the cost of living crisis really before what we're, what's coming down the tracks but everything everything that I've set out seems to be um, about to come into play, and you know, I, I think, I think, um, you know, it's such, it's such a terrible, terrible crisis that I can't imagine people won't want to reinvestigate capitalism in this country, how it works, and mm -hmm. the economies, economics of, of capitalism, and whether it's fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my background was in international business. I was in, in uh, European business school uh, and then worked in the city um, before, I had a, before I had a breakdown. Um, and then I kind of really examined it, the same things like I was taught at business school, economics, you know, you just want infinite growth. And I think at the time I was like, really? That doesn't quite make any sense. But yeah I, i'd be fascinated maybe later on to come back yeah 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 um i mean so i'd love you to speak more about the english public schools and especially about you know your book posh boys you know what drew you into writing that what was it you mentioned some of the subjects that interested you what was it that really interested you about that yeah so english or British, whatever you want to call them, private schools, independent schools. Um, it's an issue that's <clears throat> been, that was, for me personally, it was sort of sitting there in the back of my mind because right from my state primary school, that I, this, is, this is sort of my first experience of what, how, how private schools sort of impacted me in, in my life. So my first primary school, I, I had a best friend called Jonathan who, um, you know, we we spent a lot of time together in, in the community school and outside of school as well. We, I used to stay at his house, he used to stay at my house. Um, and then end of, I think it was the last summer term of primary school, my mum told me that um, I wouldn't be seeing Jonathan anymore. Um, he's gone away. It was just a young boy, best friend, just going away. It's pretty pretty devastating mm -hmm. um and she explained to me that you know, he's going to he's going to a different school he's going to school arrow and you won't you won't be seeing him again so you know that was my first experience of private school so i knew there was there was a, there's a different kind of school um mm -hmm. that took children to different places but i didn't that's about all i knew so um i guess the next time that private schools became of interest was when I sort of started to um, find work and particularly at newspapers I was saying that um, there were people who were going who had been to a different kind of school to my school mm -hmm. who had um, authority over my working life which uh, absolutely you know fine but I was interested in it because there was they were different kinds of people. I've met them at, at university um, where it didn't seem to matter quite. So this was the 1980s. It didn't, didn't seem to matter quite so much, uh, you know, what kind of school you went to because, you know, a lot, lot of people who, my friends anyway, being to private school are, are sort of very entertaining, um, charismatic, uh, good, fun, interesting people. And you didn't kind of, you didn't need to really worry about what school they went to it didn't seem to matter but in the workplace and by we get when we get into the noughties i think these kind of these kind of issues were clearly more interesting people wanted to know um what's what's the background of the person who has influence over your working life and 
Um, I'd also notice that a lot of them would appear in the newsroom, for example, mm -hmm. um, from absolutely nowhere. You know, they'd gone from their school to university straight into the newsroom. I mean, journalism, you know, there are a couple, there are the, the, the most trad traditional path to the newsroom is through a local newspaper, a news agency. Mm -hmm. You work some shifts, and if you're lucky, you get onto a national newspaper. But it seemed to me that there were people, some kinds of people, were going straight in to you know, good jobs, newspapers, without that kind of training. Mm. I mean, this is not something that I was sort of passionately bothered about, but it became an interest, and it became something that started to um, um, made me want to ex explore the issue. And I guess the next time that it came up was when it when it was a choice of which school I was going to send my children to. Although, of course, it wasn't much of a choice because uh, if you don't have X amounts of money in the bank, then you, you, that choice is, is not uh, available. So that then, and um, my partner and I had um, you know, a blazing row about, you know, because my parents had some money and mm -hmm. they were prepared to, if we wanted, to pay for our uh, son's education. My partner was keen for that to, to go ahead. I wasn't. I didn't want them to go to private school. I wanted them to go to the local school. Um, you know, and we had a big argument, and it was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think from then onwards, I'd started to 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 take a a more political interest in the subject and uh, I couldn't see I could see how they were they were bad for the community I could mm -hmm. see they were um, bad in the workplace and I could see how they were having a sort of corrosive corrosive effect on the government of this country and I wanted to write about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah thank you yeah I think it's Oh, yeah, it's a great book. I love how much research you've done into all these different people like the uh, Tony Blairs, or the, the David Camerons. Uh, and I've been trying to do this research for a while, so it's lovely to have it all in one, one place. So thank you. Um, well, there's another if you're in if um, I'm also founder of um, a think tank called Public Education Policy um forum mm. and we've got a web site and it's the idea is that we have this debate about um private education in this country and how we can perhaps um challenge the orthodoxy um and people involved in the debate are from both sides of the, the education system we've got we've got privately educated uh, members and we've got members we've got people from private schools who are also part of the debate so it's not a it's not a sort of it's not a class war um think tank it's just a it's, a, it's just we want the debate we want to discuss it because that was the other thing when i was in when i was investigating it well, the thing that bothered me the most i think was the fact that we didn't have this discussion it was sort of it was accepted that we've got a two-tier education system in this country and mm -hmm. You don't you don't question it. It's, it's just it's just what we have. No one seemed to care about the the effects it was having, the consequences of um, dividing Britain into two strands of of education. And what this was to, to to young people. Um, so the, the you know the our think tank, public education policy um, mm -hmm. forum examines. Um, all these questions in in detail, mm. um, and we have the debate. Mm, I'll put a link to into the bottom of the description. So if people want to go and visit, I have been on. Uh, one of my colleagues, Simon Partridge, kind of pointed me in the yeah, direction Simon, yeah. uh, there. Uh, so I have gone through and read a, quite a few articles. Um, I think it's again, yeah, fascinating to have the debate. And I think um, I can't remember if it was in your book or in Nick's book, because I apologise that I'm reading both yes, at the same yes. time. Um, but this idea that the entitlement illusion, I know one of your chapters is named. Yeah, I think that, that probably borrowed a lot from Nick's book, that one, actually. <laughs> right. Uh, this idea that the those who have got to the top position say, it's because I worked hard. It's the illusion is, well, actually, it's 
like you were saying about these top jobs, people getting into the newsroom, this illusion that well, actually, yes, you've worked hard, but there's also been, um, you, you know, your schooling, your background, which has helped you. Absolutely. Yeah. It puts, you know, you're at the head of the queue. Um, and, you know, no one like one of my friends is um, a, uh, a Crown Court judge said mm -hmm. um, to me after reading my book, oh, I didn't realise just how untalented I really was. You know, it was being slightly sarcastic, but um, it's a fair point, isn't it? You know, you, no one wants to sort of negate or diminish their achievement by explaining it in terms of uh, privation or mm -hmm. some sort of unfair advantage, which they were gifted as a child. Um, and, you know, obviously, a lot of it is down to talent. I mean, people, you know, talent will, will surface. But I think the problem is this talent pool that we're drawing from is pretty um, shallow. Mm -hmm. We need to widen and deepen the pool of talent because, I'm, you know, the people who, people who are in positions of authority, you know, plum jobs in this country, whether judiciary or civil service government in the city um they are a, they are predominantly drawn from uh, a cast of people who went to the same schools and you know and get their jobs because of that very reason mm -hmm. so i think it's important that especially this is something that is good for this country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in your last chapter, you talk, uh, you, you quote a few people talking about the the caste system. Um, I can't remember his name, Mehdi Hassan, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Time to abolish our educational caste system. And I think Mehdi, was he at public school himself as well? Um, I don't know, actually. All I know is he... He had the same he had the same debate that I had with my partner mm -hmm. uh, about where you know, where we where you can send your children to school, um, and he found it equally um, difficult. So mm -hmm. he, he yeah he 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 feels strongly I think as as you said that um, you know we need to have the debate we need we need to talk about it and and mm -hmm. not not accept it as something that's beyond challenge yeah yeah and so another figure you gave page 338 was in 2016 they did a study one in 20 chance of public school uh, student getting into oxbridge and it'd be one in 2000 from those who've been to a poorer background i mean that's incredible one in 20 and i think mm. you use the yeah um the reference that Bono is one in a thousand <laughs> of becoming Pope. <laughs> yeah, so, slightly facile that was actually. Was like, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was trying to just trying to draw people's attention to what back, back to what you said. It, people explain their sort of good fortune um, in terms of their hard work and talent, but you know, at the same time. They're not really acknowledging the head start they've had, um, which means that, yeah, if you go to a top private school, if you go to, you know, one of the nine Clarendon schools, they're called, because these were the, the sort of mm. big, big schools that were part of the Charities Act in the late Victorian period, which were reformed to um, advance their own causes and um, really, I'm afraid, remove any sort of, um, link between the schools and their charitable foundations. So, but if you go to one of these nine schools, so Eton, um, Winchester College, St Paul's, Westminster, um, can't um, can't remember the the others, but there's there nine. You've got, Bradley. yeah, yeah, right. you've got, um, you know, a much greater chance of winning. When I say winning, you know, gaming maybe mm -hmm. a place. Uh, uh, Oxbridge, and I think some of the re some recent stats to this 
something like nine schools, and they may not all be the Clarendon ones, have sent 3,000 people to Oxbridge um, in the last three years. I mean, and some remember that some schools, in fact, most state schools, have never sent anyone mm. to Oxbridge. So I think that that puts a sort of fine point on just what kind of advantage you're buying when you're spending an awful lot of money sending your child to one of these exclusive private schools, especially, especially the, the, um, the Clarendon schools. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, 3,000 places. That's amazing from those nine schools. So I guess I'd love to just go into a little bit about, you know, the title of the book is uh, Posh Boys, how these public schools, you know, these English public schools ruin Britain. Could you go into more depth of, you know, your findings, why you feel that currently yeah. they are the ruin of Britain? So I suppose it, I looked at it from two perspectives. So I looked at it from the perspective of the community mm -hmm. and from the perspective of the government of this country. So in, in the community, Um, I think they are disruptive and damaging um, impact on, on the community because they force parents to, parents to choose between the community and a different kind of education for their children. They take children and families out, out of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and this is it's, it's particularly, I think, damaging when... Um, a, a primary school so children will be sent to, to prep schools and some may not even go to state primary schools but quite a few of them do go to primary schools mm -hmm. state primary schools and then they leave and they send them on to to prep schools and get them ready for um, the, pub, the, the, the senior public schools and that is at that point when um, communities start to to divide because you, know, you, you suddenly you've got your your, your children are playing with um, other children. Mm -hmm. The families know each other, and I'm sure it's, it's, well. It's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened. May have happened to you. Happened to lots yeah. of lots of other people I know, who you know they realise that this family, and then no matter how hard they try, and you know whatever, how hard and whatever they say about it, they say oh, we'll be we'll still we'll still stay in contact. We'll still be friends. You know, we'll still know each other, but within a few months, maybe a year at most, mm -hmm. they've drifted away. They've gone to pursue their their new life with their new friends in a new, more um, disparate community. Um, and you know, the, the 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 local community is disrupted, mm -hmm. um, and it's denied the. Um, I'd, I'd call it sort of the sharp elbows of these high achieving um, families. Um, you're, one, when you remove them from the school, then the school kind of loses a bit of impetus as well. Or the next school, the, sec the secondary school to where the kids are going. You know, we need all the, all the families to be part of the, the schooling of our children. And we need all their wealth in financial wealth but wealth in terms of you know, the desire to you know get the very best out of the school for their children and when you when you know if if, if a family is is making sure their own child's doing well then it has a positive impact on the, the kid that that child's sitting next to and raises the standard of, of the whole school so i think that on a community level i think private schools damage society and in, in the terms of the government of this this country i've looked at that more on a it's much more sort of analytical statistical basis so mm -hmm. in this country seven percent of children are educated at private schools mm -hmm. and yet we know that in the military in the judiciary um 60 to 70 percent are um, privately educated, so come come from that kind of education background. When we get to Parliament, it's about it's about fifty percent. 
Yeah. Um, in the city, again, you know, the, the hedge fund managers, the traders, um, stockbrokers, people in charge of, of the city. Um, again, it's sort of 50 to, to 60 percent, po possibly higher, depending on the on the jobs they do. What we hear is that disproportionately private schools have a huge, you know, I would say sort of it's, it's almost offensive, the, mm. the, 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 um, the difference or the disproportionate influence they have. Mm. And <clears throat> the point I'm making about why that, why, why, does, why does that ruin Britain? It ruins Britain because these are people who are in charge of our lives, charge of the country's prospects and business, but they only have a very narrow understanding of how the country works. They know that they know what it's like at prep school. They know what it's like at a, a, a hermetically sealed, you know, palatial mm -hmm. Eton type school. And then they know what it's like to get a um, sort of plum job Mm -hmm. um, with very little effort because of their the connections they've made at these schools. So I'd say they were you know, detached from society. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that is good for democracy. And the reason I say that is because it undermines meritocracy mm -hmm. and it undermines this, this sort of founding principle of good government of this country, equal opportunity. How can it be fair? that if your parents happen to have enough money in the bank account, they can afford to push your push you to the front of the queue. queue. Mm -hmm. I think that undermines meritocracy. I think it un undermines equal opportunity, but it also, it also has a detrimental effect on democracy because when people start to realize that to get to these top positions in this country, it doesn't matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter um what sort of time you put into it mm -hmm. if your chances of doing so are, 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 are curtailed from the moment you are sent to school mm -hmm. then people start to lose confidence in the system and when people you know it goes back it's back to the community when children leave the community and they eventually end up as doctors lawyers, politicians, magistrates, and then they're sort of parachuted and they return to the community mm -hmm. to take control over everybody else's lives. That starts to look like a different kind of society. It's kind of, you know, it really is the definition of, of elitism. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's like what the um, political philosopher Michael Sandel says. I mean, you need, for communities to work well, you need, you need people to witness other people going about their lives. You know, you need to be mixing with the same families in the town halls, in the supermarkets, but most importantly, in the schools as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I could really relate to this. I mean, I went to boarding school age 11. I haven't asked you which school you went to. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, which is interesting. You didn't talk about it in, in the book, but uh, um, I, a bit like Nick uh, Duffel, he doesn't necessarily talk about what school he went to. Yeah, uh, yeah. My last podcast, I spoke with someone who I was at school with, uh, who's doing the same work. She was on the same year as me as well. Oh, really? but we didn't mention the school, partly because there was a lot of sexual abuse there. Um, really? Yeah, so... Um, which I'm in my work, I'm seeing that a lot of schools have this um, and it's starting to come out of the woodwork now. I think it Alex, is, isn't it? Yeah, Alex but, Benton's work. Yeah, yeah. No, Alex, he's done some excellent work on this subject. Yeah, mm, as has mm. Nick. Um, but it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm someone who didn't go to a private school. Mm. So this kind of boarding school abuse and the syndrome and all the characteristics around it is you know alien to me you know i i went home every night yeah. every afternoon um didn't have to um stay in, in a dormitory and um fend off the attentions of uh, 
predatory schoolmasters. So it's it's mm-hmm. it's really alien. I think it's alien to a lot of people. And we find, speak personally, but I find it very interesting and mm. and strange that there's this. It's all coming out now. I just wonder what you thought the sort of the level of the the, the scale of the problem is. I mean, me personally, I think it is is huge. And I, I guess how I'm trying to open the conversation is that if you imagine your parent went to boarding school, how that impacts you. And I often get children of ex-boarders uh, who didn't go to boarding school themselves saying, you know, my I had a call with someone last week saying that their brothers were mentally very unstable in and out of homes and things like that um and and therefore that is something i'm questioning if those in charge who've been to these like you said you spoke about boarding school syndrome it's almost like we're the children of those traumatized people so although we haven't had most of the country haven't had the experience of boarding school syndrome we're indirectly impacted in the same way that those children who did have parents so i'm like ah it's just a conversation what i love about your forum is like yeah let's just have this conversation yeah i i i, hadn't, I really hadn't thought about that that level or if at all really it's the indirect impact on children whose parents were at um boarding school yeah, it's interesting my actually my mother was at uh, boarding school mm-hmm. um in, in, in in Yorkshire um so I'm now starting to think about that <laughs> uh, yeah and um, uh, yeah, there's a fascinating conversation that Joy Shavra in a presentation she gave at the boarding school survivors forum last year and she said the link between lockdowns and boarding school is pretty interesting you couldn't see your parents same as boarding school you could only go to certain places mm. same as boarding school you yeah know, and she's like, they're kind of very similar. So, so yeah, I think just having the conversation, it's great. I don't know so if the it's lockdown really syndrome wrong. and boarding school syndrome could be uh, similar. Yeah, yeah, how it yeah, yeah, affects people's mental health. Do you think? I think so. Yeah, you know, and because. And and then the other thing, which is the prefects, they could do what they wanted. They didn't have to follow the rules. <laughs> that yes. was the same at our school. Oh, you could walk certain places. Yeah. You know, you could walk on the grass. The masters could, whereas the students <laughs> couldn't. It's like, ah. So, again, it's... Let's call them, let's call them Johnsons for the sake of a, a better word. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so, I would love, you know one of the questions I really had was, I guess, you know, we talked about this a little bit about um, apartheid. And I think mm, yeah. you mentioned this at the back of your book again. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the quote of the person. Uh, yeah. That was um, Anthony Selden, who okay. was master at uh, Wellington college. He was the one who, you know, he's, he's, um, you know, fascinating character he's been a you know he's been a top um private school educator for for many years and he um at wellington he he developed these progressive ideas in terms of how a private school should should work with the local community and mm-hmm. support state schools and he was the one who first coined this idea that we have an apartheid education system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not, you know, this idea that um, there's something wrong with our two-tier, edu- I call it two-tier education system, you know, mm-hmm. um, rather than apartheid. It's, maybe you don't need to say that. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't need to say that. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, it's interesting that it's people from within the system who who see see there's a problem. People like Selden, but not just but politicians as well. So, or or people like Michael and Wilshaw, who was the former head of Ofsted. You know, he could he saw mm-hmm. he saw the problem. He saw how the private were operating in these um, 
social responsibility vacuums and were not performing their charitable function properly. They, they are, they, you know, they, the problem is they are supposed to be charities. So there's a, you know, there's a legal duty to do charitable things, perform charitable acts. And, you know, it's clear that it's really sort of lip, paying lip service to mm -hmm. charitable um, functions. But not just, you know, not just Wilshire, Wilshire, not just um, Anthony Seldon, people within the private school state, but politicians as well. So Michael Gove has spoken about mm -hmm. um, the, the, the problems with, with private schools and how you know, perhaps they don't deserve the, their charitable status and the advantage they have over, over state schools. Um, and um, until they was in the process of drawing up plans which would which would curb um, the um, charitable mm -hmm. um, well, denial of charitable action by private schools and they would have to they would have to perform their charitable functions to a demonstrable degree that was that was her idea but that green paper never never went anywhere and but even just cut even, out there i think sorry. it was you you meant you said uh, theresa may was that yeah with the green paper that's right yes yeah it was theresa may's um government his, his green paper um um established the idea that the top private schools would have to fulfill their charitable functions more clearly. This is kind of not this de minimis rule where they open their swimming pools on a Monday night to the local state school kids and that's it. And they tick the charitable function box. That, you know, that sort of thing is not acceptable. And that she was saying, unless they do more and, and perform the charitable function to a meaningful level, then they would lose their charitable status. And that's quite a big threat, I think, for a, a Tory government. Because if you if you remove charitable status, you're, you're removing these tax um, advantages they have. Mm. You know, they don't pay um, corporation tax. Um, they only pay eighty percent on their on their business um, rates. I mean, it's quite a big um, stick to beat them with. And and Labour is currently pledged to remove charitable status without even having the the debate. So. They are facing new threats, threats they hadn't haven't faced before. But could I just ask there, because as I was reading your book, I was just looking through my notes this morning. I could see that it was 1817 that boarding schools should no longer be considered charities, a law case. And I'm thinking and then I look through and how many times again, Atlee's government reform. And, and that was a bit I read in, in Nick Duffel's book, 1945, the saying that it would be an equal. I'm thinking, how many hundreds of years have that we've been trying to take away the charitable status? Yeah, it's true. It's been a, it's been a story of failed reform. You know, even Winston Churchill mm -hmm. said, um, and this was it's, it's interesting because it's the beginning of the um, Second World War. When you know, 1940, 1941, it was just a series of calamitous defeats, you know, from Dunkirk to Singapore to the early campaign in North Africa. It's a sort of defeat after defeat after defeat, and the British public were getting um, pretty riotous about what was what was happening because you know, the confidence in the the people who were leading our military was was um, being questioned. Mm -hmm. And people started to say, "Well, hold on, who are these people who who who, who are leading this country to defeat?" Mm -hmm. And it became clear that it was it, was, it became a class issue. And, it, and when you drill down to it, it was it was they all went to the same schools. Um, they were all products of the same system, mm -hmm. um, and they turned out to be rather useless um, military leaders. Mm -hmm. And so Churchill was forced to respond, and his response was you know, an education act that would, in his words, flood the private schools with um, boys, which meant that 
um, disadvantaged children from the community would win more places at the school so they would be much more balanced institutions reflecting society um fascinating but by um so by 45 um when churchill was ejected and you know clement attlee mm -hmm. founder of the national health service the welfare state and everything you would have thought this was that this was the point when private schools days were numbered i mean his cabinet was the most um um I don't know. It's it, the, the fewest number of private school ministers were members of his cabinet. Only only a quarter of his cabinet were privately privately educated, which is extraordinary. And so people did think this was the end. This might be the end of private schools. But uh, Ali himself was privately educated. Um, you know, the the desire perhaps wasn't a priority anymore. Although we were going to change, we've got to you know. First, Second World War was a war that was going to end all wars and we were going to create a, a, a country fit for heroes. Mm -hmm. um, abolishing private schools probably wasn't top of the agenda. So nothing happened. Then we get to 1960s under Wilson's government. And it, you know, once again, you know, the, the issue of private schools became something that politicians want to get a grip of and they they set up a couple of commissions to investigate it and commissions recommend yep it's a massive problem yep we need to re certainly remove boarding schools that's not working very well um and we certainly to make them much more charitable you know and perhaps even we need to you know the most radical recommendation for the wilson's commission was we need to abolish them um but once again nothing happened i mean it's, it's noteworthy that wilson ended up sending his children to to private school anyway and and, and so did uh, you know and, and labor politicians have been doing that for a very long time so perhaps one can read into that a sort of cowardice or lack of willpower or, or self-interest in, in radical reform of our education system um and you know, and t Tony Blair did, in fact, um, make a reform when he became prime minister. One of the first reforms he made was to remove these assisted places schemes, which was a Thatcher idea whereby the state would sponsor uh, a child to go to private school. But well, all this, it just, it just it just keeps private schools in business. It, sort of feeds the unfairness of the whole thing um and he he removed that that was the last significant challenge to, to private schools so mm. i would all i'd say on that is um watch this space because mm. i think there is a an appetite to remove charitable status yeah yeah and i guess i'm, I'm where time wise that it's suddenly going to go uh up to an hour uh, so I'd love for you, you know, the last 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes, to talk a little bit about solutions, please, Robert. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, what what can we do if what we've tried before has not worked? You know, what can, yeah, what, what are some of the solutions that you, you've kind of outlined? Mm. Well, I think... First of all, I think we need to say that, and you know, the argument's always been, look, it's getting, it's getting better. Things are changing mm -hmm. for the, the greater good. There are you know, fewer privately educated um, students at Oxford and Cambridge, for example. You know, the, the numbers. You know, ten years ago it was sort of seventy percent, thirty percent in favour of private schools. Now it's fifty-fifty. Perhaps it's even it's fewer than that i think this year's figures show that it's it's down to about 40 percent privately educated so the arguments are that we're making headway mm -hmm. um but i would on on that i would say that um what what in, in terms of, on the ox oxbridge debate mm -hmm. a lot of privately educated students from overseas and our universities you know, need their money and they're you know, they advertise and they open doors to them. 
and these, these are mostly from private education backgrounds, but they're not counted in the, the overall figures. So when these figures that the universities trot out in terms of how many are state, how many are private, they don't include the privately educated overseas students. So I would say that it's, you know, it's good. There is, there is certainly some progress being made, but perhaps it's not as, as brilliant as we think it is. And it's distorted by the overseas element. So I would say that on, on that, on, on um, the political class. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Clement Attlee's cabinet and how, you know, extraordinarily, um, reflective of society it was in terms of membership and then you sort of you get up to um thatcher where it was 80 percent privately educated 20 percent state so that is that's clearly heading in the other direction mm -hmm. um and then you know things started to improve under the blair government you know we were down to sort of 60 40 50 50 sometimes um but then it's it's tick right up and now we're in the situation where we have a comprehensively educated prime minister liz trust yeah who is leader of a cabinet who's is constituted of i think it's 74 percent privately educated i mean these are levels not seen since the 1990s it seemed to be going going backward it's a very diverse it, it's diverse in terms of ethnic makeup but you know that's one measurement of diversity but it's not very diverse at all in terms of of um, background and education so i don't think we're making any progress at all and the argument that things are changing and it's more and we and, and and you know we're, we're heading for a more egalitarian society is not true and certainly not true in in private education because some because the numbers of people now going to private school something like six hundred thousand children attend private schools in this country mm. 1970s that was that was only half that number three hundred thousand going to private school so you know it's it and they, they're booming as well you know they're extraordinarily mm. um, um profitable institutions mm. you know they're selling off land across the country um housing estates and making you know, eton and winchester college but you know, two huge um developments in the southeast of england where they're raking in millions from their, their institutions from these from these the sale of land um the private school sector is booming you know and they're in an arms race with themselves in terms of facilities you know, swimming pools theaters stabling facilities you know all this all this sort of thing they, they run like sort of five-star hotels because you know that's the level of of um financial interest in them these are the kind of families who they're they're catering now the international um tycoons oligarchs um rich families from all over the world who want five-star facilities for their their children so i would say we're a sort of peak um private school and I, I would I would say we need to do something about it because I think it is corrosive, corrosive and damaging to, to British society. And so you ask about solutions. Mm -hmm. in, in the book, I suggested three things. And the first one was removing charitable status. I can understand why the state should subsidize um, schools which are educating members of the, the royal family mm -hmm. and wealthy Chinese tycoons the fact, or children thereof so that doesn't seem very fair and plus the fact that they don't seem able to perform their charitable function anyway so we talked about 600,000 children going to private school in this country mm -hmm. only 6,000 receive a free education wow. so we're talking about one percent mm -hmm. of children who go to private school actually get a, a, a genuinely free education the rest have to to pay and these these scholarships and bursaries are sort of you know distributed in on their own on the school's own terms so mm -hmm. you know if if they want to give it to a very successful young sportsman from a local state school 
then they can do that. It's, mm -hmm. it's up to them who, or if they want to give it to um, the brother of a child who's been to the school and, and knows and the family, you know, the well connected with the school, then mm -hmm. they can do that. These aren't necessarily, these bursaries and scholarships aren't necessarily awarded to the most deserving families. So I would argue that charitable status is not something they, 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 they're capable of performing. Um, and then secondly, I would um, impose some sort, well, if that doesn't work anyway, I would certainly, I would, if that doesn't work, and I would also remove um, any other, any other state subsidies that private schools benefit from. For example, the military and the and the and the diplomatic corps in this country. You know, their children are all, all senior members of, are allowed to um, receive private educations for free. You know, that to me doesn't seem that doesn't seem right. I don't see why we the state should be supporting um, private schools in that way. I don't see why the sons and daughters of officers and diplomats can't go to state schools. I don't see why that, that is a problem. I mean, there are state schools. It's possible to find places for these children. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's do that. So, you know, you're knocking, knocking away the advantages, the financial advantages of, of private schools in this way. So I don't imagine that will have too much effect on the top tier school. So then I would introduce the third my third proposal which is to impose quotas on on private schools mm -hmm. what this means is if seven percent children in this country go to private school then we impose um quotas in at the top universities so in oxford and cambridge would not be able to take on more than seven percent of the student intake each year mm -hmm. from private schools uh, that would that would be that would be fair um and we might need to go further we might say our politicians our mp only seven percent of our mps can be privately educated mm. um you know we might extend it to the whole public sector and start asking questions about where what sort of advantages did you have to get to the position you are in now or to the point upon applying for this um top job and you know this is all people would argue this is all kind of social engineering and um you know it's a sort of it's sort of revenge politics but uh, mm -hmm. i think if you if you're serious about creating a a fair society then and mm -hmm. this is the way to do it it may may not be possible to abolish private schools you know, people the right to pay for your child's education is inalienable, perhaps yeah um under under human rights law. well know. interestingly though i was reading that uh, you mentioned um i've forgotten the name of the, the guy who said oh barnaby lemon saying you, you quoted yeah. the book, page yeah, Lemon, yeah. united nations universal declaration of human rights the right yeah. to a private education is it inalienable and is enshrined in the United Nations. Interestingly, in Nick Duffel's book, page 10, he yeah. quotes George Monbiot, and he suggests in 1998 that boarding school offends 11 articles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So <laughs> I was like, oh, that's interesting. Good, 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 Nick. That, that, that's great, isn't it? Because, you know, that's for the lawyers then. That's, that's, for, the, that's for the courts to decide. But I just think that's going It's a problematic um, path to to go down where you're where you're asking families to litigate for the right to to pay for their child's education. I I mean I think if you bring in tough enough radical reforms, you don't need to do that because let's face it, this is what the schools trade on their ability to send disproportionately more children to private school or get disproportionately more kids into the top jobs. If if you block that avenue then yeah i think you'll find that it, it suddenly becomes a disadvantage to send your child to private school mm -hmm. and 
think the whole business model starts to fail. Um, Sorry, you're, I don't think you need to abolish them. Your you signal's dropping out a bit, aggressive. Robert. Yeah. It's been good, but just the last couple of minutes. Um, so just that last 30 seconds, you're saying? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I don't think on the on the issue of abolition, it's problematic. Um, you don't want to have families litigating in courts for the right to pay for the education of their their child. I, th I think that's a, a bad look. But I think if you impose radical reforms on the schools, and the ones that I've suggested, and the most radical would be some sort of quota system or asking questions about the backgrounds of applicants to top public jobs, public sector jobs, then I think you are you are undermining the whole business model of the private school because that's what these schools trade on. They 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 advertise, maybe not um, overtly, but it's certainly subliminally the the, adver the advertisement is uh, you send you pay the money, you send your child to this school you've got a much greater chance of getting into uh, getting your child into top university and ultimately into mm -hmm. one of the best jobs, um, you know, available. you know, your, your child's life chances are going to be um, dramatically improved mm -hmm. if you pay the money. But if you, if you deny them that opportunity and you reduce the odds, so they become fair, um, then should, then families will start um, boycotting them. They'll they'll send their children to to state schools, and the the, the quality of our state schools, political sort of drive behind our state schools will improve, and public schools will become an irrelevance. You know, the, the only reason you'd send your child to a private school would be for snob value. That would be it, and I think that's not a bad place, really, for them to be. Mm, mm, mm. thank you thank you robert yeah so I, what i'm hearing is first thing would be removing charitable status second thing if that doesn't work um state i'd get rid of the state subsidies state subsidies stop paying for diplomats and officers children to go to private school yeah turn to state schools and then the third thing would be imposing quotas on private schools um you know, 7% are allowed to get into universities and things like that. Um, you know, I'd love on one level to hear, and, and, and I know Nick and Joy have been trying to bring that in, is, well, there is an impact in sending your child away, you know? So actually, is it really, you know, I'd love to have some, some studies and how much people who've been traumatized at these schools have to pay in therapy. Is it yeah. balanced out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is, that's a, a line of investigation that Joy and Nick have um, pursued in successfully, I think, made, have made the point mm. that there is a mental health cost to boarding schools. And I think, um, you know, my sense is that people are, have listened to that argument and will now think twice about sending their children to, to a boarding school, to, to carting them away um, and removing them from the family and, and, and um, passing the responsibility of um, parenthood to you know, strange men. Um, so hope, hopefully that, that warning is being listened to and the, you know, the, the, the current abuse inquiries that are, being carried out seem to sort of back up this argument that you know that it's not a good idea to place children in these cloistered um, environments and then don't have a rule like mandatory reporting when mm -hmm. things go wrong um, and when you find that a teacher has acted you know either in an abusive way or predatory way you don't make this known to anyone. You simply um, get rid of them and pass them on to the next school and the next set of um, victim children. You know, that kind of thing is just, is terrible. And it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an issue that needs to be addressed and, and 
think boarding school syndrome um, survivors and people like um, Simon Partridge and Alex, Alex Renton, you know, are making this a serious issue and one that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I really appreciate the work you've done in bringing this more to light. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Is there any final bits? I mean, I realize I haven't asked all your questions, but all the questions I sent through. Um, is there anything you'd like to to add, you know? Uh, I think we've done quite a good job on um, covering all the, well, not all, but a lot of the ground. As I said, public, um, <clears throat> sorry, private education um, policy forum is a good, it's a really good place to um, look. And I'm really keen on people joining and taking part in the debate or just being part of the conversation mm -hmm. or even just receiving the newsletter. You know, that, that, would, that would be great. I think it's a start because I think it needs to be, we need some consensus and we need a, we need a conversation to get going so that we can you know, inform the debate. And that, that's part of the problem has been, there just hasn't been enough information about uh, I'm going to use the word apartheid again. I said I wasn't going to, but <laughs> social apartheid education system, or two tier education system, mm -hmm. system and what we're doing in the country, and why we're still, after you know, 600 years, we're still stuck to it. And I suppose we could, I could go back to you know the original intention of the um, medieval Christian philanthropists who founded our first private schools, people like William Wickham. 1381 he founded Winchester College mm -hmm. his dream you know he was a, he was a peasant he was the son of a peasant farmer who ended up as Bishop of Winchester and then advisor senior, senior Lord Chancellor to Richard II I mean his idea was that these schools would be founded for the the, the poor indigent of society and it was his way of you know it, we, we lived in very pious times and it was his way of um honoring god and doing the right thing and that's how these schools first started you know there's no reason that they can't return to those kind of values mm, mm, mm. yeah thank you yeah so um is there some way of people reaching out to you learning more about your work and uh, your website um Anything else? Yeah, well, I'm very happy to talk to people. Uh, my website is um, yeah, robertverkake.com, I think. It is, yes. And there's an email, it should be an email on there. Great, great. And I'll put down the bottom the link to your books um, and also to the Public uh, Education Policy Forum Network as well um so yeah so thank you real pleasure speaking you to you today thank you so much for the work and as i say to all my guests if i can support in any way you know please do let me know well you are supporting aren't you i mean kind of you're doing the kind of work that you know brings attention and you know serious interest to a subject that it really needs it i think i think your work is is excellent i know people who've um, benefited from your therapy so uh more power to your elbow is what i would say and thanks again for taking an interest in uh, my subject or our subject How about that? Our subject. yeah well thank you real blessing thank you robert okay bye-bye <laughs>